uh, first of all, thank you all for being there. Uh, today we are going to discuss a topic which is very important. Uh, so when we talk about diabetes management, there are one third, one third, one third, right? One third is uh, nutrition, one third is medications, and one third is patient compliance, right? So actually today we are not going to just discuss uh, one third of it, we are going to discuss two third of it, except, so except for medications, the diet, and the patient compliance, right? These are the things we are going to discuss. So uh, we'll mainly focus on type two diabetes because remember if you talk about medical nutrition therapy in diabetes, it includes type one and type two. Uh, but we'll focus more on type two right now because type one, you know, you need to, we need to discuss carb counting and other things which are uh, uh, slightly different. So we'll be mainly discussing today's topic on type two diabetes. Okay, so these are the three broad uh, outline topics which we are going to discuss. So we'll discuss about basics of diet in diabetes, the importance of diet in type two diabetes. We'll discuss about importance of diabetes specific nutrition. Uh, and we'll discuss some uh, innovations that we have done in this field in terms of uh, a virtual dietitian and obesity management specialist. Okay, so <clears throat> let's first discuss the basics of diabetes in type 2, right? Now, when you talk to a lot of patients, you know, patients read a lot of things about diet on the internet. Uh, there is a lot of Google knowledge and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, knowledge which they acquire from Instagram and, uh, you know, WhatsApp and so on and so forth. Uh, and then they come and discuss with you that, you know, should I try this new diet, which I heard, you know, keto diet and paleo diet, and they'll talk to you about all kinds of diet they've heard about. The most important thing, and trust me, this is the, uh, that's why I said it's one third of diabetes management. It is not the type of diet which has a name or which has some characteristics, which is important. What is very important is that any healthy diet, if it is followed for a long period of time, sustained like a religion, only then it's going to work, right? So whether you are going to do a keto diet or a paleo diet or whether you're going to do a Gujarati diet or whether, you know, uh, Assamese diet, it really does not matter. As long as two things, it should be healthy and it should be followed like a religion for perhaps a very, very long period of time, right? If you're not able to do that, it doesn't really matter what kind of diet you're trying to follow, right? So that's a very important lesson which all your patients should be uh, told and, you know, your patient should understand. First of all, you know, uh, how good is uh, dietary modification, right? So uh, does diet in type 2 diabetes really reduce the HbA1c? Answer is actually yes. So if you talk about newly diagnosed patient with diabetes, a good dietary advice and a good dietary follow will reduce the HbA1c close to 2%. And a patient with diabetes, you know, for perhaps more than four years, the HbA1c reduction will be 1%. Now, just to put this in context, if you take any medication, perhaps the most effective diabetic medication in the world, perhaps something like a GLP-1, the best HbA1c reduction is close to 1.5 to less than 2%, right? So purely to say that an HbA1c reduction of 2% is more than any existing medication in the market, right? Uh, in fact, to achieve this type of HbA1c reduction, uh, you will require multiple medications, perhaps even insulin, right? So that is, that is the uh, ultimate thing right so a good dietary follow uh, is going to really help now there are five key aspects of medical nutrition therapy in diabetes especially type 2 diabetes so one is we'll discuss each of this in a little bit uh, detail carb consistency proper meal planning weight loss and exercise a balanced calorie intake and nutritional content of the diet right so these are the essential pillars of uh, dietary management so let's first talk about con caloric content right now this is something which is all of us understand, right? So, you know, 1200 kilocalorie diet, 1600 kilocalorie diet, right? So, does caloric restriction work? Absolutely, right? It's like, uh, you know, railroading through the problem, right? So, if you have, if you're typically taking 2200 kilocalories a day, if you reduce that to 1600 kilocalories per day, whether you are, you know, uh, whatever stage of diabetes you have, it is going to be helpful, right? So, caloric restriction is definitely helpful. There are a lot of studies where they found that if you just take a study of just the fasting blood glucose, you'll find that the calorie restriction reduces the fasting blood glucose. Post meal, of course, it is easy to understand, but the fasting blood glucose also reduces with the caloric restriction. And if you talk about, uh, you know, if you give an estimate of caloric need based on weight for weight maintenance, typically, and this is the broad outline, uh, a men or active women typically require 3,300 kilocalories per kg. Now, this is the 
caloric requirement for maintaining the same weight. So if you are somebody who wants to maintain whatever weight you have, not gain the weight, this is the broad uh, requirement you need to have. So women with or sedentary men or elderly women, you'll require about 28. Uh, sedentary women, obese adults will require 22 and pregnant and lactating women will require 33. So this is the amount of calorie per kg you'll require to maintain the same amount of weight, right? So what it means is that if you want to reduce the weight, you will have to reduce, go below this level, right? This is the weight maintenance level. If you take more than that, you'll gain the weight. If you take less than that, it is going to reduce the weight, right? You can actually uh, estimate uh, calories for weight maintenance. You can do that. Uh, I'll show you. Uh, we have made a uh, virtual diet, virtual obesity specialist, which can actually do this uh, online without, you know, very lot of complications, right? Now, so we discuss what is for weight maintenance, how much caloric restriction you require for weight loss, right? So, you know, the amount which we discuss, you just need to subtract, subtract about 500 to 1000 kilocalorie per day for your profile, right? So you're an adult, so we saw here that you're an active uh, uh, woman or you're a man, uh, your daily requirement is 33 kilocalorie per kg per weight maintenance. You need to subtract whatever value you get, right? Subtract 500 to 1000 uh, typically, and this will produce a weight loss about 1 to 2 kgs, right? This is the overall target. Now, though 1 to 2 kg per week is something, you know, a lot of patients will also like, but it's not a realistic target. Your realistic target should end of the day be 1 to 2 calories per month, and that is more reasonable target to follow. But at the same time, the idea is that you need to follow this type of caloric uh, you know, uh, cut basically to re reduce weight loss, right? Now, what about weight loss and activity, right? So how much is really weight loss helpful in glycemic control, okay? So now the modern principle of diabetes management, if you see, uh, there is there are a lot of studies which are done on this. There is a trial called direct trial, right? So in direct trial, what they found was that patients with, you know, newly diagnosed or even long-standing diabetes, uh, they put them on meal replacement strategies. So what they did was they started replacing the meal with, uh, you know, with proteins and like we are going to discuss meal replacement uh, in the later slides. What they found was that they started replacing the meal, reducing the, uh, uh, cutting the calories and started reducing the weight of the patients. And typically patients who lost about 15 kgs, almost 70% of these patients had diabetes remission. We are not even talking about good control. The diabetes literally went away, right? So. Having said that, I think Indian patients probably would need to even lose less amount of weight. We have seen patients going into diabetes remission with typically weight loss close to 10%, right? If it's an 80 kg male, you know, you have seen them lose 8 to 10 kgs and their diabetes literally becomes normal, right? So weight loss is definitely helpful for uh, control. Uh, even a 5 to 10% weight loss will be helpful for glycemic control. A typical 15% of weight loss can actually lead to uh, diabetes reversal or diabetes remission, which is something which is which is the new, uh, uh, you know, uh, data which you have really learned. So typically, you should try and, uh, you know, your weight loss and exercise goals. So if you have a motivated patient, right, who comes to you with newly diagnosed diabetes, this is what we tell them. We give them a rule of 10 that, look, you need to lose 10% of your weight. If you want to get off medications, if you want a healthy life, try losing 10% over a period of six months, right? So it's a very, uh, you know, easy, elegant target to have. For example, an 80 kg person, you say, you know, uh, next three months, I want you to lose four kgs when you come on follow-up and another, f uh, you know, three months, you lose another four kgs. So eight kgs over a period of uh, six months, which is a reasonable target. So typically one to two kg per month, right? That's a reasonable target. When you tell this to the patient, patient is motivated. Fine, one kg per month I can do, right? Not that difficult, right? So that's something which is a reasonable target. The, actually, the problem is maintaining that weight. A lot of patients in the earlier in enthusiasm, they lose a lot of weight, but then they regain the weight. That is also a problem. That will come to that point uh, uh, in uh, later. But the point is that uh, this is the typical, uh, you know, weight loss that you need to, right? And if you want to normalize the sugar, and again, even the earlier trials also, UKPDS trials also. So now, of course, we know from direct trial that weight loss leads to remission. But even earlier studies which were done, like the UKPDS trial also found that patients who lost 10 kgs, about 16% of the weight, the normal, uh, you know, uh, if the fasting blood sugar was something around 140, uh, their fasting blood sugar, their blood sugar became normal. And even those with blood sugars of 200 and 250, if they lost about 20 to 30% of the weight, which is very difficult, uh, they, their fasting blood sugar became absolutely normal, right? This is old study, but the new study actually shows, uh, you know, even with 15 kg or uh, 15% also, it's a typical, uh, you know, a good result, right? So what should you tell your patients in terms of short term and long term goals? Typically, like this is what I say that over a period of a month, short term, try to lose about 1.5 to 3 kgs over a period of uh, maybe six weeks or maybe three months, I would say. And a long term goal, 
try to lose about 4 to 5, 4.5 to 9 kg. Again, typically, I would say 10% of the weight is what you try to uh, suggest to your patients, right? What are the strategies, again, similar to what we discussed in terms of glycemic control, calorie counting, exchange diets, meal replacements, medications, bariatric surgery, these are all options for weight loss. Uh, so even, you know, you use uh, bariatric surgery in terms of weight loss strategy, that is also shown to produce diabetes remission. So it's very important to understand that if you want your patient for, and whatever the baseline weight, right? Remember, a lot of patients come and tell us that, uh, you know, I'm very thin, right? I'm not obese. But Indian patients typically have a lot of visceral fat, and if you if they lose this fat, uh, even if they look visibly normal, visibly uh, thin, visibly, you know, this is the concept called thin fat Indians, right? If they do that, their, uh, uh, you know, typical uh, diabetes tends to improve uh, significantly, right? Uh, there are a lot of trials which have shown uh, calorie counting methods in, right? There's a DPP trial, look ahead trial. Uh, all these trials looked at various strategies for uh, weight loss in diabetes patients, right? And again, uh, you know, like I said, uh, this is the kind of, you know, uh, calorie you should try. So again, a broad principle, if you have anybody close to 100 kgs, you know, 1500, 16, 1200 to 1600 kilocalories and more than uh, 114 kgs, maybe a 1500 to 1800 kilocalories should be the uh, starting point to where you start with. Another way is, of course, meal replacement. We'll discuss this meal replacement concept, very important, right? Now, uh, meal replacement uh, is is we'll discuss in detail but the point very important fundamental principle is that uh, if you can replace perhaps start with one meal a day and you can replace that one meal with a type of nutrition which is which is specific amount of calories specific amount of protein specific amount of fat then what that does is that the patients that you know it becomes a packet system where the patient can actually follow something very closely for example Let's say I say that, you know, uh, you're having three meals a day, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So instead of dinner, why don't you take uh, perhaps, you know, this Ensure powder, uh, three scoops or six scoops in water once a day instead of taking your usual dinner, right? So we're replacing one meal with a restricted system where there's a particular amount of carbs and calories. Now, you know, what this will do is typically, uh, you know, it does two things. One, it helps the patient, you know, actually reduce the amount of calories which the patient is taking. Because you, when I allowed to have food ad librium, right, like we did, for example, you say we have a buffet meal, right? Uh, you know, there is unlimited food, right? You can eat as much as you want. Uh, even if the patient tries to restrict, they'll always be, uh, patient will always go overboard, right? There is, a lot of studies have shown that there is no way in which the patient can actually 100% restrict to the calorie which they've been told, right? Instead of that, if you give them a measured amount of system where you take six scoops, put it in water, have that instead of your dinner, they have a measured, exact measured amount of calories and, uh, you know, macronutrients which they're consuming, right? And if they're able to do that, that becomes a very useful strategy. Secondly, it also improves the patient compliance, right? Now, because that patient knows just like, you know, taking medications, they are now replacing the meal with something which is effective, right? So this is another very effective strategy. Are meal replacement successful? They have been proven in clinical trials, and I'll show you one Indian clinical trial which, which the meal replacement strategy has been proven. Uh, how many meals and snacks should be replaced? Perhaps you can start with one meal or one snack, right? Uh, for uh, And if you want weight loss, typically, perhaps maybe two meals or uh, one meal and two snacks is something you can try and replace, right? Then, of course, you know, you have the diabetes exchange system. This is developed by American Diabetes Association, where they say is that, what they say is, you uh, take the various, uh, you know, uh, macronutrients and replace them with a healthy macronutrient, right? So, for example, we do this very commonly in our own practice, that, you know, uh, if the patient is taking, uh, you know, rice, we tell them to take a, you know, uh, perhaps uh, perhaps shift to something more, things, something like a coarse grain, right? A wheat, instead of that, we replace them with jawar, right? More complex carbohydrates. So, the idea is that whatever, you know, uh, macronutrient which the patient is taking, instead of replacing the entire meal, right, so instead of saying that from tomorrow you will be having keto diet, no, what we are doing is we are replacing one macronutrient with a more healthy macronutrient. So if the patient is having bread for breakfast, we say why don't you have a multigrain bread for breakfast. So that, see, that what that does is that eases the patient into a more healthy lifestyle, right. Like I said, compliance is very important. Suddenly, uh, you know, one fine day I can't make you uh, change as a person, right? It is a gradual process. So, uh, you know, uh, that is where the patient compliance is, is uh, coming into picture, right? So if I say suddenly from tomorrow uh, to tell a person who is who is non-vegetarian, say that from tomorrow you will be having only vegetarian diet for the rest of your life, it is not going to be easy, right? Or you tell a person who is non-vegetarian that from, from tomorrow you will have a keto diet, which means which there will be no carbohydrates in your diet. It's not possible. It's not possible. Try doing... <coughs> 
most patients, you know, keto diet, most patients fail. Why? Because it's not possible. It is not feasible, especially in a country like India, especially in Gujarat, especially in Ahmedabad, it's not possible, right? So because it's quite simply that kind of food is not available where you can completely cut off carbohydrates, right? So it's very difficult for patients to comply with something which are very complicated. Instead of that, keep things simple. Try to say that, you know, instead of uh, from tomorrow, instead of taking, you know, uh, this, this protein, take a high calorie, you know, a high value protein. Instead of taking this fat, take this fat, right? So that kind of meal exchange is something which uh, is very useful, right? And ADA originally came with some ideas for meal exchange strategies. Uh, you know, we'll not go into detail of that, right? Uh, about physical activities, right? Typically, uh, your patients are, should be told that you should try and uh, for general well-being, patients need to have 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise daily, right? That is about 150 minutes a week. And for uh, weight loss, if your intention is weight loss, then 60 to 90 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise daily. Now, one very important concept, which again, we need to remember. Remember this, and this is a fundamental concept. Patients need to understand this, and a lot of, most of us don't understand this. If you want to lose weight, exercise is the worst strategy to do, right? Uh, exercise strategy, no matter how intense, without a dietary intervention, you cannot lose weight. You cannot lose weight with exercise alone, right? Uh, gyms tell otherwise, you know, you'd have seen big ads. Of course, uh, you know, uh, this is their strategy to promote it. But, you know, you'll see a lo lot of ads from gyms and a lot of, you know, these kind of exercise programs, aerobic exercise and all that, that, you know, lose weight, right? Purely with only exercise, you cannot lose weight. But exercise is very powerful for maintaining weight. So if your intention is to maintain weight, it's a good strategy. If your intention is to lose weight, it's not a very good strategy. Exercise combined with dietary intervention, so exercise without dietary intervention, is it's, it's not possible to lose weight, right? So this patient should be told categorically that a lot of patients come and say, and you know, when we were also young, you know, we were uh, of that thinking that, you know, Acha, we'll have an extra pizza and then we'll, uh, you know, burn that in the gym. That is not possible. That is, that is a wrong way to do it, right? That pizza is never going to be burned in your gym, right? It is going to be burned in the oven only. It's not going to burn anywhere else, right? So that's something which is uh, important uh, we need to understand, right? Then, of course, you know, one very important thing from, and we have, uh, you know, you guys work in the hospital, and this is something which is very important when you're dealing with uh, patients on insulin, patients on multiple doses of insulin, and patients who is admitted to the hospital. I think this is a very important concept which we all need to understand. It's also a very important concept for type 1 diabetes. But any patient specifically on insulin, uh, a carb consistency is very important. Why is it important? Remember, especially patients who are on insulin, our job is not just to reduce their blood sugar, but also to prevent hypoglycemia, right? So my patient on multiple doses of insulin suddenly decides from tomorrow, I am going to uh, follow keto diet, right? Uh, patient is going to land up in trouble, okay? Uh, what we require is that the patient maintains a consistent carbohydrate peel. We also need to understand this very important fundamental that if your blood sugars are, if you take different amounts of carbohydrates in all means, your blood sugars are also going to fluctuate, right? So, uh, especially patients with more insulin deficiency, right? You, we, we see a lot of type 1 patients. Uh, even a small change in the carbohydrate content, suddenly the blood sugars go very high. Sudden change in the carbohydrate content, blood sugar goes very low, right? So, uh, in a normal person who is not having diabetes, the insulin is able to match for the amount of carbohydrate and uh, amount of, uh, you know, carb content that you're having. But a type 1 patient without insulin or patients who are otherwise insulin deficient, they are not able to match this, right? So it's very important that carb consistency should be maintained. So especially when you're working in hospitals, uh, this is a very important fundamental which is absolutely required. So when you do the planning of the meal, try to maintain consistent amount of carbohydrates in each of the meal, right? What that does for us is that it helps us plan the insulin regime in a more effective way. So typically we suggest that uh, you should suggest a 30 to 45 gram carbohydrate during meals, major meals, and about 15 grams of carbohydrates during snacks, and typically 130 grams of carbohydrate, right? Again, of course, it's not just important that you we maintain the amount of carbohydrate as the same, but we also maintain the glycemic index in a similar way, right? So it cannot be that 15 grams of carbohydrate the patient is having burfi of 15 grams, right? That is not going to work, right? So the same amount of the type of glycemic index which the patient had also that is also something right so again when you're planning especially in hospitals especially in type 1 patients uh, this is a strategy which is very very important very very essential right uh, talking about nutritional content and this is where the fat diets really come into picture uh, if i tell you a pop quiz which is one diet which has proven the test of time and which has 
Uh, there are multiple studies which have shown benefit. Again, I'm not promoting this like I already, you know, I'm in a sense contradicting my own point that we should try and uh, inculcate diets which the patient can follow. But if I'm asked in a theoretical way, which is the best diet to follow, uh, if you could follow that, it is Mediterranean diet, right? For some reason, consistently, they have done many, many, many studies in all kinds of situations. They have done studies in type 2 diabetes, they have done studies in, in obese people, they have done studies in cardiovascular patients, and they found that one diet which is very successful in all kinds of situations is Mediterranean diet, right? Somehow, and it, is, it has just worked. Uh, Mediterranean diets have shown long-term benefits in a lot of clinical trials. It is now proven beyond a point that Mediterranean diet is an essential and very, very useful form of diet which everybody should be able to try and follow, right? So uh, again, if you have somebody who is motivated and somebody who is, uh, so basic principles of Mediterranean diet, if you see, a lot of it, you know, they contain, they, it contains a lot of nuts and a lot of legumes. Remember, a lot of olive oil is a part of Mediterranean diet, right? And somehow olive oil has also been found to have cardiovascular mm -hmm. protection. Uh, you know, a lot of fruits are there. Uh, there is a small amount of dairy products as well. And if you if they are non-vegetarian, lean meat is what is generally given to them, right? So these are the uh, fundamental conce concepts of Mediterranean diet. There are a lot of debates on why Mediterranean diet is very successful. Uh, one theory is always that, you know, it's probably all of this is nonsense. It's just the nuts and the olive oil which is helping them. But at the same time, right, uh, what has been shown is that overall as a package, as a Mediterranean diet package, you know, uh, this is something which is very useful, right? And if some of you is a, you know, budding entrepreneur, I'll tell you, you know, uh, this is something which is a uh, lot of, there are a lot of companies which promote keto diet and a lot of companies which promote all kinds of other diets, right? None of these diet is going to work because one diet, I think Mediterranean diet is also very close to Gujarati or, uh, you know, Indian food, right? It's very similar. Right, so if you, if I am being told that you know, if you, if I want to make a company which sells a particular type of diet, I think Mediterranean diet is the one which is going to be most successful because not only does it have very strong clinical ba backing, but at the same time, it's also something which Indians can follow quite easily and quite understand quite easily. We all know the concept of glycemic index, right? Glycemic index is that, see, same carbohydrate will not produce the same amount of response in terms of glucose, right? So if you have a 15 gram of white bread versus 15 gram of whole wheat bread both will have different response in terms of glycemic index, right? Uh, so this is this is the concept we need to understand. So if you are having, like I said, 15 gram of burfi, it's different from 15 gram of a juar roti, right? So that's something which we need to important. So the how much is, does the does, uh, amount of carbohydrate increase the blood sugar? That is glycemic index. And beyond glycemic index, we need to understand the concept of glycemic load because, you know, if the glycemic index is very high, but the load is very less, it's fine. Right? Where the glycemic index is very low and if you take a large amount of it, it is also going to be helpful, right? It's not going to be helpful. So, uh, you know, this is a often, you know, uh, question which a lot of people ask, can a patient with diabetes take watermelon, right? What's your answer? So it has a very high glycemic index, right? So is it good? But it depends on the portion size. Yeah, so let's say a reasonable portion, right? Yeah. Very right. So very true. So the point is, as a general concept, and this is again a frequently asked pop quiz, uh, Watermelon, right, has high glycemic index, but if you take watermelon in terms of the portion, if you have a reasonable portion, uh, it is, a lot of it is water, the actual content is less, so the glycemic load is less, right? So that is that is what you need to understand. So that even though the glycemic index of a watermelon is high, the glycemic load is less, right? So that is, again, you know, if your patient really enjoys a watermelon, you can say fine, but the portion control is very important, right? So. Uh, low glycemic index foods have been shown to be better. Remember this, if you want to reduce the post meal sugar, glycemic index is very useful, right? So a lot of patients, you know, we talked about fasting blood sugar. If you want to reduce the fasting blood sugar, that the only way of doing that is when you start reversing the fat from the liver, right? You start reducing. So if a long-term caloric restriction and reduction of the liver uh, glycogen content, you know, uh, the liver fat content, only then you will achieve good fasting blood sugar reduction. So it's a long-term process. But if you want a postprandial sugar reduction, you will require just require one thing, and that is reduction of the glycemic index. If you just in reduce the glycemic index, the post meal sugar is reduced, right? Now, of course, a uh, lot of patients will ask you, you know, uh, I'm sorry that these are all frequently asked questions. You kind of, you know, put things from here and there. The idea is, you know, uh, though there might not be incoherence, we actually learn a lot of things in this way in our own brains, right? A lot of patients ask about alcohol. 
right? Every day I have at least two patients, right? Gujarat is supposed to be a dry state. I hardly believe that. Uh, so, uh, alcohol, can I have alcohol? They'll always ask you, right? There'll always be one patient, no day is complete without anybody asking me about, you know, should I, can I take alcohol uh, in diabetes, right? Now, the point about alcohol is, few things patients need to understand, right? See, alcohol is not pure alcohol, okay? It is alcohol plus carbohydrate mix, right? And different types of alcohol will have different amount of carbohydrate in, in, uh, mix, right? For example, uh, let's say a beer is more carbohydrate and less alcohol, right? Now, what you need to understand is alcohol in itself will reduce the sugar. So alcohol content will reduce the sugar. The carbohydrate content in the beverage will increase the sugar. So there's a disproportionate. So a beer will rapidly increase the sugar of a patient, right? But perhaps a uh, Maybe a uh, you know uh, maybe a whiskey would probably reduce the sugar, right? So that that balance has to be kind of maintained. Uh, so on one hand, when they are taking alcohol beverages which have a lot of carbohydrate, sugars will go up. At the same time, if they take you know uh, certain types of beverages, it, they can develop hypoglycemia, right? That is something and it could be dangerous hypoglycemia. So it's very important that when they are taking alcohol, all alcohol is not the same, right? So my question always to the patient is. Ki alcohol, what alcohol, right? What do you consume? Because your answer is going to depend on that, right? If you're having a beer, I said, no, you can't, right? If you're having a whiskey, again, I'm not saying promoting it. I'm saying no, but the point is that the strategy is different, right? When you're taking a beer, your blood sugar is going to go up. When you're taking a whiskey, probably your blood sugar will go down. So that is where you need to strike the balance. Uh, alcohol content, again, you know, if you take Mediterranean diet, typically wine is part of Mediterranean diet and wine has, you know, red wine specifically has found to have some cardiovascular benefits but remember again here also moderation and patient you know portion size is important right so uh, uh, somebody who drinks wine like a fish is not going to get cardiovascular benefit right so that is what something which we need to understand and typically again all recommendation is that you restrict to less than two drinks per day in men and less than one drink per day in women that is the standard recommendation always uh, which is there right so having said that i think it's a complex topic but the answer to that question is that you should sit with your patient and probe more in more detail instead of giving a generic answer. We say, no, no, you can't have it, right? Then patient will say, no, uh, I want to have it, so I'll change my doctor, right? That is how it is generally, right? So, uh, you know, patients want to hear what they want to hear. Always remember this. They don't want to hear what you is right. But having said that, it's always very important to discuss these aspects and then leave it open-ended, leave it for the patient to decide on their own terms. Right? Look, if you're going to take this, the sugar can go low. Are you ready for that, right? Are you going to check the sugar? These are things you have to be careful, right? So these things you need to keep in mind. Okay, uh, nutritional supplements is a very controversial question, right? So every day on Facebook, when I open the Facebook, and when I'm today I'm going to go home, I open the Facebook, there'll be 10 supplement ads. Remember, Google is also listening and Facebook is listening to, you know, your mobile phone is there. All of you go home and you will find a lot of, uh, you know, you guys will allow me anyways, but, uh, you know, you'll get a lot of uh, ads about uh, diet supplements and keto diets and all that. Right? You'll also get a lot of ads about supplements. Right? A lot of the supplements are nonsense. Okay? It's basically expensive urine which you're creating. Uh, there is some merit in certain supplements in diabetes, but a lot of it is actually hogwash. Right? So be careful. If anybody promotes this, supplement is going to change your life and it's going to make you, you, know, uh, make you the next, next Hrithik Roshan, it's not going to happen. Right? It's, it's very unlikely. One supplement, one uh, component has been shown, trace element has been shown to have some some minor effect on glycemic control is chromium, but again, chromium in excess also found to produce hepatotoxicity and liver toxicity. So it's something you know which though though uh, you know uh, though something which is a lot of people have thought and tried, but it's not something which is the it's not a silver bullet, it's not a magic bullet, right? That's something you need to important. A lot of people promote cinnamon, right? Uh, cinnamon, uh, dalcini, taj, right? This is what it's known. And again, trials have shown mixed benefit. Again, if somebody patient comes and tell you that oh I have heard that you know. Uh, cinnamon is going to change my life? Probably not, right? It's not going to change your life. But, but you know, again, there are some studies which have shown uh, to be, right? Uh, artificial sweeteners. Again, if you remember, I, uh, you know, remember when, uh, you know, many years back, Lara Dasta used to promote artificial sweeteners, if you remember. And she used to say that, oh, look, I have this, right? She would go to the gym and say, I'm, I'm having this and you know, I'm losing weight, right? Uh, you don't see Lara Dasta. Neither see Lara Dasta anymore, nor do you see those ads. Why? Because it is now proven beyond a point, right? In fact, now a lot of, uh, you know, uh, all these regulators have said that artificial sweeteners promoting weight loss do not advertise that, right? 
So it is not true. Uh, artificial sweeteners do not produce weight loss. Okay. On the contrary, there was one red flag, and there were a lot of times where they thought that in fact it can produce weight gain. Right now, why is this dichotomy? First and foremost, artificial sweeteners. The concept was that if you replace the uh, sugar with artificial sweeteners, you are reducing the calorie, and hence you are producing weight loss. This was a theory, but that amount of calorie deficit is not that big. The problem was, and this is where they did studies in animals, where they found that use of artificial sweeteners actually changed the gut microbes, and changed the gut microbes to such a way that it actually promoted weight gain. So, on one hand, you are minor; there is reduction of weight. On the other hand, there is because of the caloric redu reduction, but then there is change in microbiomes, which can actually promote weight gain. So, it's actually, in a sense, weight neutral. Okay, so there's non-caloric sweeteners, all of them. Right? If you are seen right now, they stop promoting that as a weight loss. In fact, you don't see a lot of ads also of artificial sweeteners these days. Very few of them, right? Uh, so patients will, and again, again, you'll you'll also have a lot of patients come in. They would have read something again on the internet that you know it produces cancer and all that. I think the view overall is neutral. Okay, it's neither. Again, it's not a magic bullet that is going to make you Lara Dutta, nor it is going to kill you. Right? It is neither. It does not make does not the newer artificial sweeteners do not produce. Uh, you know, uh, cancers, uh, they can be taken taken in moderation. Having said that, they are not going to make you thin and lean as you expect, right? So again, the only recommendation whenever patients ask you about artificial sweeteners, it is only this, that artificial sweeteners can be taken for taste. If you feel that you have craving for sugar and this craving can be fulfilled by artificial sweeteners, take it, right? Otherwise, don't take it. Don't take it for any nutritive or benefit of any type. It's not going to benefit you in any way. It is not going to harm you in any way. You take it only for the taste. Having said that, and trust me on this, okay, why artificial sweeteners, even this strategy, artificial sweeteners have failed? Because actually the, the, the craving which we have for sugar is actually because of sugar. It's not because of the sweetness, right? A lot of patients, you know, will come and say that isme wo maza nahi hai jo actual sweet mein hai, right? That is the reality. You, you know, that's why something like Diet Coke and the, you know, uh, they promoted that like anything, right? Even now they do it, right? But they stopped promoting it anymore because they realize that patients, uh, people, the general public do not like Diet Coke. They don't like it, right? Uh, because that, that kick which the sugar gives, the sugar rush is not there, right? So artificial sweeteners uh, is something which is neither great nor bad. It is a neutral thing, right? So these are the things we need to all keep in mind. Okay, now then let's move to the, uh, you know, a uh, couple of other principles, right? Fruits. All patients come and ask you this. I don't know why there is a big fetish of all patients about fruits, right? Konsa fruit ka sakte hai, right? Without this, there is no consultation. I talked about alcohol, but there is no single consultation which does not talk about fruit. Okay, now the overall sensible stance on fruit is this. Fruits, when taken as a whole, are good, okay? And in diet, diabetics, it is generally recommended that they can take one fruit a day. There is no harm, okay? They can take one fruit a day, but couple of principles. A, they should take the whole fruit and not make it into a juice, pulp, etc. right? Because when you make it into a juice, you are removing the good parts, the fiber, and you are just taking the ones which is sugar, okay? Secondly, remember, and this is again a lot of, you know, uh, quacks and a lot of things, you know, they, it, it's meant to fructose hota hai, whereas your, your, you know, glucose is the one which is a problem. Fructose is equally harmful. Remember this, right? Fructose is equally harmful. In fact, fructose, a lot of this non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and NASH, uh, one of the important causes, triglycerides being high, fructose is the cause, right? So fructose is also harmful. It is not, again, it all comes down to this moderation, right? If you are going to take fructose like there is no tomorrow, it is going to harm you, right? So, one fruit a day, accept it. Prefer the ones with a lower glycemic index compared to higher glycemic index. But, again also understand glycemic load, right? And portion size is very important, right? So, watermelon is fine as long as it is taken in moderation, right? If you enjoy a small amount of watermelon in, in with diabetes, if it's a whole fruit which you are consuming, it is okay, right? Uh, if you are going to take 50 apples a day, it is not going to probably be good, right? So one fruit a day in moderation, preferably low glycemic index is something which is a good idea. Okay, 
So again, this is the watermelon part, right? So watermelon, remember, glycemic load is very low, right? Even though the glycemic index is high, right? So that is something which is to be kept in mind. Okay. Then of course, let's move to, uh, you know, the concept, the topic which we are discussing today, which is the uh, meal replacement, right? So we'll talk about glycemia targeted specific nutrition and we'll talk about evidence. Now, I introduced this concept to you earlier and this concept we are going to draw more into it. One strategy which has worked in a lot of clinical trials, including the recent trial, which is a direct trial, was meal replacement. Okay, This is perhaps, uh, I would say a beginner's way because the other things are more complex. Right? To say, tell to the patient that, you know, ye tum bet ke ye banao, is tarah se banao. This, this takes time and this takes a lot of patience and this takes a lot of training. Right? Uh, one fine day, uh, you can't really say that from tomorrow onwards your kitchen is going to change. You are going to go to eat this or only going to eat that, right? Uh, it is something which is a gradual process. But one thing which can be done immediately. So if you have your patients who, uh, you know, ask you that, uh, look, I need to, you know, my doctor has said that uh, I, you know, my weight is very high and that's affecting my knee. So, you know, I have to undergo osteoarthritis operation. I need to lose weight probably early. What is a good strategy from terms of diet, right? Medications, yes. Bariatric surgery, yes. These are all options. But from a diet point of view, what is a good strategy? The best strategy for good control early on from a nutritional perspective is meal replacement, right? It's a proven effective strategy, right? It is simple to follow, right? And if the patient is compliant, they'll get very good results, right? Always comes down to patient compliance. Always remember, that's why I said one third of diabetes management is compliance. If the patient is not compliant, nothing is going to happen, right? Patient will, you know, patient, you prescribe whatever medication, the patient is not going to take the medication, what is going to help, right? So meal replacement is a very good strategy for a patient for early intervention. This is something, right, which, which and patients will start seeing results very early. Strategy is very simple. Start with one meal a day, replace that with a nutritional supplement, right? Now, what nutritional supplement is also important. It's not just easy to say that, you know, uh, just replace it. So when you're replacing with a meal supplement, it should be tailored to what the patient really requires, right? So if the patient is having diabetes, your nutritional supplement should contain a low glycemic index carbohydrate, right? Which is complex carbohydrate. If your patient is, you know, patient requires protein, it should have good amount of protein, right? It should have low amount of fat. If your patient is, you know, prescribe a high protein diet, your supplement should have high amount of protein, right? So what kind of supplement, what kind of meal replacement you're doing, that depends on uh, what kind of patient you're dealing with. When you talk about diabetes specific nutrition, that is ensure diabetes and so on, uh, it used to be called Glucerna, right? The name has changed, right? Uh, it's internationally still available as Glucerna. Uh, it, that's a patented product, right? It's a patented product. Uh, they were the first to really come up with this concept. Now, there are a lot of uh, companies which have tried copying this, but a lot of them have not been successful because one of the very important aspect of it was the actual carbohydrate in that, right, which is very, you know, which is a patented carbohydrate. So it has a, you know, a very specialized carbohydrate blend, which is fiber and slow absorption, which is one which is very effective. And you have a uh, good protein content and blend of mainly MUFA. And you all know monounsaturated fat is something which is, right. So basically what you do is, you, uh, you know, in terms of the benefits, uh, diabetes specific nutrition offers, obviously because it has, you know, a high fiber, uh, low GI carbohydrate, it offers better glycemic control than standard formulas. Now, of course, studies have also shown that it induces GLP-1 secretion, which is something we'll talk about in a minute, and it promotes weight management as well. So it, it's something which is effective for weight loss as well. This has been all proven in clinical trials. The good thing about diabetes specific nutrition, see, one thing about nutrition is, uh, unfortunately, is that nutrition, when you do clinical trials, right, it is very different from what happens in real life. In a clinical trial, right, a lot of these diets are very effective, right? Keto diet, you know, the patient becomes Hrithik Roshan, actually. But in real life, doesn't, right? Even Hrithik Roshan doesn't become Hrithik Roshan with keto diet. That is the problem. Why? Because real life is tougher than a trial, right? In trial, everything is controlled, right? Uh, there's a nutritionist calling, you know, the uh, patient every day, Ke aaj kya khaya? what did you eat, right? Here, the patient, you know, uh, comes to you after one month, two months, three months, right? 
and in between they would have done a lot of parties and you know gone to a lot of uh, marriages and everything right and they'll come and confess they bahut shaadi mein gaye the but the point is real life is much more difficult right so that the problem with nu- nutritional diet is this the only nutritional diet which has shown very effective is the meal replacement that's why when they when you know dr roy taylor decided to do a study where they wanted to show diabetes remission they used a strategy of meal replacement because they knew that this is the best way of seeing how the patient is really responding right so there are a lot of trials on diabetes specific nutrition there are in fact 23 studies uh, you know uh, where they looked at and they did a meta analysis of this as well and they found that the study outcomes the glycemic control lipid status the requirement of medications everything improved with diabetes specific nutrition and the thing about diabetes specific nutrition is typically the post prandial blood, blood glucose reduces by about 20 mg per deciliter uh, overall 31% to 45% reduction of glucose load this has been shown in lot of studies this is something which is very easy to prove right and uh, some of you have you seen cgms right continuous glucose monitoring you have seen continuous glucose monitoring try having your patients you know uh, we have done this in the past uh, uh, you know we say that you replace your let's say your dinner with a diabetes specific nutrition and see the response on your cgm you will be you will be surprised with the amount of flattening of the glucose that you get after the meal right so it's a very effective uh, strategy right there is now a study done in india also right in terms of the glycemic target specialized nutrition right uh, come to this the indian evidence this is a study done by dr v mohan where they looked at diabetes specific nutrition uh, and satiety in obese indian type 2 diabetes patients right they took a patient who had obese uh, and what they found was that this diabetes specific nutrition basically reduced the hb1c reduced the overall fasting glucose i told you remember fasting glucose reduction is something which requires a sustained process right you require a longer process there is reduction in post prandial glucose which is much easier to obtain there is also greater de- reduction in weight uh, in the intervention group and the intervention group did not have any uh, you know other uh, problem right now one very interesting thing which has been shown which is a recent understanding have you heard about glp1 right so you all heard about semaglutide right uh, it's a rage right right now there is no hollywood star who is not on semaglutide right there is nobody everybody is on semaglutide okay semaglutide is a glp1 receptor agonist which is extremely effective for weight loss weight loss you can lose 10 to 15% easily right just like that right only thing you require is lot of money because it's expensive right so if you have a lot of money these days weight loss is not difficult okay the thing is a cheaper way of doing it is actually using diabetes specific nutrition because what uh, ultimately what semaglutide is is a glp receptor agonist glp1 agonist glp1 is something it's a signal to the brain what is glp so glp is basically uh, you have the you know certain cells in the in this time right when you have food uh, it these cells secrete this glp1 which starts secreting insulin right so it prepares the body for the nutrition uptake this is the mechanism right it's a signal some amount of this glp also goes to the central nervous system and starts producing satiety saying that look abhi khana aa gaya abhi zyada nahi khana hai right now you need to stop eating at some point right so that is the system what happens is us human beings have broken the system because our mothers would always say aur do chammat le lo right so what we did was we by forcing force feeding since childhood uh, what we have done is we have produced a system where there is now resistance to this glp right so you produce a glp resistance so what happens is that you don't get the same amount of satiety with the same amount of food you require more food to produce satiety and we have now successfully made a system where you can actually bypass the satiety saying that acha pet mein jagah nahi hai lekin dessert to main khaunga right so that is bypassing the satiety we already done that right we have successfully done that that's why we need more glp to produce the same effect right which which you have right i'll tell you one interesting thing which lot of patients on glp uh, now we have lot of patients on semaglutide and uh, you know more than 100 for sure a uh, lot of patients on glp first thing they come and tell me is that i feel like i how you know these are 50 40 50 year old people right they come and tell you that i feel like how i used to feel when i was a teenager in terms of satiety this is very pertinent point because what happened was when they were teenagers their glp system was intact they actually feel satiety right and they'll go out and play and go out and do some other activity right they are not obsessed with food right now that is being restored right 
So to produce the same effect, which was naturally there in the body, you now need to give more GLP from outside, expensive GLP from outside, right? Uh, a natural way of doing is using diabetes-specific nutrition, which actually promotes more GLP, endogenous GLP secretion. So by doing that, you are actually producing your own body's own GLP in a more uh, better way. And when this is done for a long time, the GLP production, actually they have shown in studies that GLP production is higher for patients on diabetes-specific nutrition, right? So this is something which is an effective, perhaps a cheaper way for patients who cannot afford a semaglutide, right? Patients who can afford a semaglutide, that's a good option, right? That I will always say that. So this is a good option, right? Like it, we have talked about the Indian study here. So basically to conclude uh, a few things, right? Uh, and this is the conclusion which is there, but I'll tell you my few take home messages and few conclusions that I would like to draw from my own. Like I said, diabetes management uh, is one third, one third, one third. One third is lifestyle measure, one third is medications, and one third is compliance, right? So if you can do two third of this, right, good dietary and lifestyle measures with compliance, you probably don't require the other third, which is medication, right? So you need to, you know, if you can do that, and that is the first thing I always tell my patient, that I'll give you a dietary recommendation and we'll talk about it, but you have to do the other one third and follow it. If you're not able to follow it, there's no point of discussing a diet with you or no point of discussing uh, lifestyle with you because that lifestyle is only effective when it is followed, right? So compliance is very important, right? When I write a prescription, it is assumed that the patient is going to be compliant. But when I'm giving a dietary recommendation, we don't always assume that patient is going to be compliant. That is the problem. So it is very important that nutrition is given the value which it should be. And like I said, a good nutritional supplement, a good nutritional program can actually reduce HPA1C close to 1% to 2%, which even, even semaglutide does not produce 2% weight loss, a 2% HBLC reduction, right? 2% HBLC reduction can be done naturally if the patient follows the dietary recommendation. Second, target, right? And always focus on the fact that you could weight, consider weight loss as an additional strategy, even if you are otherwise lean. You, any type 2 diabetes weight loss strategy is something which is useful. And typically, if you lose 5 to 10 percent weight, your glycemic control is going to be better. If you lose 10 to 15 percent of the weight, you can actually have remission from type 2 diabetes, which is a good goal to have. There are different strategies for weight, for diabetes control, for weight loss. We talked about various things. Uh, diets like Mediterranean diet is a good idea. Carb consistency is very important. You know, meal replacement strategies are good. But another good strategy is to have replacement with a diabetes specific nutrition, which is something which is useful. And very importantly, we all lose our GLP-1 system when we are older because we force feed ourselves. We change, we disturb our own milieu, right? Uh, people who have been able to eat like they used to when they were teenagers have actually maintained the same weight as they were in teenagers and probably their life is also much better, healthier. But we are not like that, right? So there are two ways in which you can restore this GLP, either actually take GLP or which is expensive or perhaps consider using nutritional strategies which can restore that system, right? Mm -hmm. And diabetes-specific nutrition has shown to be, uh, have clinical evidence for its effectiveness, right? So I'll end here. There were a lot of slides which I did uh, skip. Some of them were important as well. Perhaps you can discuss that in some other uh, session, but uh, we'll be happy to take questions. Okay, before I end, uh, something I'd like to show you. So uh, we have used, uh, We made this uh, virtual dietitian, right? So uh, we all, all heard about Chat GPT, right? So okay, let me. Okay, so this is a virtual. Dietitian. This is uh, available uh, if you have a Chat GPT subscription. So here uh, you can see here, uh, and you can in fact try it out. Uh, you know, I'll show you another another example of what we tried. Sorry. Yeah. 
So this is a sorry, not this one. Yeah. So uh, here you're, I'm saying that I'm a, a 50 year old uh, female patient uh, having type 2 diabetes and I am uh, a Gujarati, right? And can you make me a meal plan for, okay, uh, which is a place in India. Can you, uh, so today's, let's say my festive day, uh, please suggest a low carb 1600 calorie diet, which I can consume while also enjoying the festivities of the day, right? So this is a festive plan. So they, this is a plan they've suggested, right? You can see it can quickly generate a diabetic plan specific for the patient, right? Uh, tell me if this is a good diet plan. Right, so uh, you know, breakfast, so on and so forth. Right, you can see here, so it's generating the entire plan uh, in seconds. So again, you know, you can see a uh, lot of things which you always tell your patients: portion control, hydration, sugar-free options, cooking style, etc. Right, so it can actually generate the entire uh, dietary recommendation within seconds depending on the question. You can in fact try, you know, asking a lot of other questions as well. Uh, and we are actually uh, fed a lot of, uh, you know, research data inside it. So it's something which is going to be uh, very useful. Right, so thank you. And we'll take questions if you have.